bit of questions and it'll be especially hopefully appropriate to the current group going back and starting their self-review and as they come up to their first report. But also hopefully there'll be some tips for people who are about to do impact reports, like Helen that I can see there. Um, oh, I can see you. You look so good, propped up in bed. <laughs> um, because it could be that there's some tips for you about analyzing data coming up and, and better ways to uh, write your reports and, and submit the, the findings and your actual impact report. So, what have I got in store for you ce soir, this evening? I'm hoping, what do I do here? Aha, goodly good. I just thought I'd give you a quick overview about what's going to happen. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, creating a, a process for self-review success, or that could equally read um, impact report success. We're going to have a quick look at actually how to analyze data because in my mentoring that I've done with many previous STLPs, something that crops up is that actually in your life experiences, perhaps not everybody has done analysis of data and had to think about how to do that and how to make sense of it and make meaning of it and then present it. So we'll, we'll just talk our way through this and we'll have a bit of a look at what your final report might look like and then have some question time. But I'm open to being interrupted at any stage because heaven forbid you should listen to me too long. So let's get started. Mm, find mouse, click, ha ha. Creating a process for self-review success. It all hinges around your big evaluative question. And um, at the risk of sounding like a, a stuck record, this is really the key. So you need to, yeah, you've already worked on your big evaluative question. The people doing impact reports have already set their question in action. And it should be relating to our big goal which is about improving students' engagement and achieving achievement. Sorry. And in order to do that, you need to be able to define all the terms inside your question. Uh, because by doing that, then you're able to consider what are the indicators. So how are you going to know that you're actually getting anywhere with improving students' engagement or achievement? So if we think about defining terms, it's really important that your science team, whoever they may be, have a really shared understanding and, um, of, of the terms that you write down. And we talked about this uh, last week, actually, with the current group. I'd suggest that you actually write down your shared meanings and understandings, because that's just a useful way to have something tangible that you can refer back to later. What did we mean by such and such? Um, it'll help you consider your, which, uh, the effectiveness of your questioning. How will you know you've achieved your big evaluative question? So this is all about having your terms really well defined and your questions relating to that evaluative question. So for an example, perhaps, you know, like some schools, this is a, I'm actually using some examples from previous work that I've done with people in schools. Some of it's been after they've already gone out and done things. Some of it I've had an input into and we've discussed before they get out there and do stuff. So one school's big evaluative question might be, what is the quality of science curriculum delivery at such and such a primary school? So what do we think um, we'd need to define there? Obviously the word quality. We need some sort of shared understanding about what quality is gonna look like. What do we mean by quality? How are we going to actually measure quality? And to see how that's gonna affect everything else uh, that we incorporate into 
all of our information gathering. <sighs> what have we got here? Investigative questions. Right. When you are coming up with your questions, this is hot tips. I think it's really important to put aside everything that you already think you know and pretend that you know nothing. It's kind of an awkward place to be because you will have a lot of depth of understanding about where your school are at, where your students are at, where your staff are at, where your community's at. But you kind of have to pretend that you don't know that and just think about the question, your big evaluative question, how can we find out as much information as relates to that question, regardless of what you already think you know. And so in that way, you're going to need to try and tease out all the different aspects of your big evaluative question. And as you well know, uh, you're asked to do this in three different ways for each of the three groups that you're dealing with. So you'll be doing it for students, for staff, and for your community. Hmm, I wanted to talk for a few minutes about designing research tools. Uh -huh. Sorry, the pauses are as I'm, I'm becoming familiar with it. The whole, I didn't practice this this through you know this is just like oh yeah what did I mean by this what did I mean by that I'm very sorry am I yeah yeah it's a strange situation yeah yeah because you're just talking to yourself I'm not getting any crowd feedback I can't see <laughs> I can't see if you're yawning or you're smiling or whatever anyway there are <laughs> lots of ways to gather information and I think it's quite important perhaps now we could um, let everyone come on board Michael and throw some ideas if you're going to be trying to gather information from your students your staff or your community how might you do that do people want to write ideas okay I can't actually see the chat so you right Here's my mouse. It's not showing me chat. I can read your chat. What a right. So we could use a Google Doc to gather our information. Thank you, Gillian. I like a Google survey. Oh, excellent. Interviews, focus groups. Now we're cooking with guests. Yeah, yeah, it feels slightly more interactive. Thank you. Face to face talking, fantastic. Okay. Yep. What else? Yeah, yeah. What else could we do? Here they come. The dreaded survey. Buzz groups. I like the sound of that. Ah, very good. Very good. Yeah, so you're onto it and you're already, you know, like well and truly thinking of a variety of ways gathering some data itself. Well, we're going to move on to that in a minute. So just I brainstormed with myself. Oh, look, we're away watching students. I really like that observation watching students. That's quite a powerful way. And we will have a look at that um, later on. Absolutely. I think um, some of that face-to-face, -face, the dreaded survey. Oh, hi, Anthea. Um, and also like interviews. I know, speaking of interviews, gathering information from your staff, I know that Anthea has recently spoken one-on-one -on -one to, hello, to all of her staff. Mm -hmm. Waving. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So what we've done there then is we've 
we're all on board with uh, a great variety of ways of gathering some information. What else do we need to think about? Uh, factors for success when we're doing this. We need to be strategic. We need to think of timing. We need to think of who, when and how we're going to be gathering information from. Uh, I think the timing was especially like staff after school. Some of them we've talked about this before so I'll fly over it. Uh, strategic, that's things like when are your parents coming into school anyway for something else? Can we be strategic and hijack them for a few minutes in order to somehow gather some information about what they think about science? Uh, keep it manageable. Uh, sometimes, yeah, especially the people related things, interviews, observations, they can become quite a lot of work to manage. So keep that in mind and be a little bit smart in that respect. Use your knowledge of the school system. Be really clear about what you're asking. And the old remember to use an even number scale to try and avoid fence sitters. Okay, I just wanted to have a quick uh, moment with you thinking about writing questions. Let me see. Uh, sorry, I'm just consulting my plan here. Da -da -da -da. Oh, yep. So if we look at this slide here, which is actually taken from a past school. It's, it's a question that was asked to teachers. Can you have a read of that and, and, and make some comments in the chat? If, so put yourself in the situation of you are being asked to fill in this survey. You've been given one of the dreaded surveys as a staff member from your science leader and this is what it says. What, this is one of the questions in your staff survey. Yeah, let's get some feedback going. What do we think about this? Michael, I'll read your screen. Oh yeah, okay, I'll read the axes out for you. The top bar says ideas for pra, which I'm assuming is ideas for practicals. The next line says online resources, I'm assuming. The third bar down says the nature of science. And the last bar says how to incorporate. And I think it means how to incorporate science into your program. Hmm. So what it, I'm sure you'll have some comments about this. What do you notice? Too big a question. Fantastic. That's, that's the way, Gillian. It's a really big question. And it's also quite guided. No, 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 Michael. Don't, we, well, we know that you're older than us. But, but that's not an that doesn't matter. Read the question out loud to yourself, just wherever you are now, and see how it sounds. I always do this. What have we got? Aha. Thank you, Redka. It assumes that we're not effective. Yes, there's a typo. Okay, so we're learning some things here. If you read it out loud, I've tried to do this. See, see how it sounds to you. What do you feel you need more upskilling in to become more effective teaching science? It's, yeah. So something to learn from this and why I've put that there is when, when you're writing questions, which was the focus of the slide, be, get your grammar right, get your spelling right, and read it out now to yourself to make sure that it makes sense. Okay, that's stage one. Then think stage two, what do we actually want to know from this question? And as Gillian pointed out, it's really, really big. And Helen's pointing out each of those bar areas is really too large as well. 
Okay. No, there's nothing wrong with grammar nerds. <laughs> uh, uh, because what we're trying to do here is present a professional approach. And I think that is also something to, that's really important right throughout this process, that you're trying to present a professional approach to your leadership in science. And so as you present things to your staff and students and community, that should all be pretty professionally done. Um, and if that means that you need to get a friendly set of eyes over it to help proofread and, and manage that, then that's exactly what you should do. Yeah, and the, yeah, cool, moving on. Oh yeah, sure. Are there answers given in Or was it an open-ended question? This is actually the question as it was given. So it was guided into these four. They only had, they had these four things to make comment on. It was very prescriptive. Yeah, it wasn't an open-ended type question. Okay. Um, yeah, so things to consider are how will it contribute? This, how will this question contribute to answering your big evaluative question? Will it provide a good information as much as as much info as possible? Good, concise information. Is it clear? Is it clear? Oh, look at that. I did that especially for you, Michael. <laughs> Is its grammar and spelling perfect? Cool. And are you asking one, just one thing and not having asked 11, 50 questions? Mm -hmm. Are you asking a single, oh. simple questions that are easy to understand? Oh, absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. So, at this stage, I'd hoped to be able to insert a little film clip to give myself a bit of a break and give you something more entertaining than me to watch. But there's some technical glitches with doing that through this sort of session. So I've put a link to that video down in the bottom left hand corner of this slide, which will be shared with you afterwards. Um, and we can send the link. I can email you the link. Yeah. It takes a lighthearted approach at comparing qualitative data and quantitative data. And it's quite important that you have a vague, yeah, have a pretty clear idea really about the differences between quantitative and qualitative. But I'm going to let you, I guess, yeah, read up and, and do that as a homework task more than something that we're going to labor at the moment. So that moves us on in our process for success down to analyzing data. So this is assuming now that you've written some really effective questions and done some effective information gathering around your big evaluative question. You've got a whole heap of information and now it's time to analyze it. And so this starts with a mantra that I wrote down the other day from Jen on Thursday at our Principal's Day. Thank you, Jen. Full credit there. Collation is not analysis. So to merely, in your report, give the results of bar charts you know, just to present bar charts in a, in a collated way is not the same thing as analysis. When you're doing analysis, you're going to need to keep a really open mind to, um, to what the results are telling you, not to what you want them to say. And I, and I know you know that. You want to be able to identify things that are positive, what's going well. Um, and, and I would expect that there will be some things that are going really well. But also, there could be some negative things, some gaps where things aren't quite happening. And there might be some interesting things as well that need further investigation. Or that you're not expecting. Or that you're not expecting. Yeah, yeah. Some... 
fant yeah, exactly. Things that you're not expecting. Um, it's a mindset that you kind of have to put yourself aside for and be very technical about in that, yeah, try not, try to keep an open mind, try not to dismiss results that you don't like. Uh, sometimes happens. This is, you know, these tips come from me working with a variety of people over a number of years. Um, try not to make excuses for results that you don't like the look of or that don't quite tell the story that you're hoping for. Just let them tell their own story because, well, in the, for the current group at least, they are your baseline data. For the people doing impact reports, I'm sure that they will be just amazing. You know, you've done as much as you can in the period of time that you've had in your situations. And when it comes to measuring that, there will be improvements, okay? And, and just, you need to, yeah, be relaxed and be sure of yourself, gather your information, and then you'll be able to compare it back to that baseline data that you gathered all those many months ago. Uh, when you're analyzing number, uh, data, rather, you want to be coming up with some sort of number or an overview statement depending on whether it's uh, quantitative or qualitative. And we're just going to have a wee play around uh, and a look at a couple of examples of that uh, based on things that I've seen before. So here is, she says, looking at her notes, another example of quantitative data. When you teach science, how do you teach it? Okay, and there's a bar graph there. What do you think that that's telling you? If we were trying to analyze this, because we're up to the analyzing part now. So what can we learn from this? Uh, the bars down the side say as a, the top bar, first bar says as a standalone subject. The second bar says as an integrated into other curriculum areas, and the bottom bar says other. Well, six, 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 and four. Yeah. I know. It is interesting, isn't it? Because we've got. 12 res <laughs> yeah, 12 res people responding to this one and so some of them have been able to, through the design of the question, clearly they've been able to respond to more than one of the bars. These are things that you need to think about as you design your surveys. Do you do you want people to say more than one thing or is it actually quite important that they only say one thing at a time? You know, like commit to how they teach science. We've got two chat comments. Oh, cool. What's coming on? Is, um, what does other mean? Yeah, not great to put it there. So that's really good, Redka. I oh, know I'd agree entirely. If you're going to use an other, then they really need some... Uh, opportunity to explain what other is in a, in a sentence or something, don't they? So that you know what they're talking about. Wondering what other is. Could have been broken down. So is the survey result from one school? If so, there doesn't appear to be any consistency. Yeah, um, this is an example of some data from, from a, a previous school quite a while ago. And you're right, Helen, it does tell us about the consistency of approach, I suppose, throughout that school. So these are the sorts of themes you'll be well onto it when it comes to trying to interpret what that information is telling you. Where to next? Have a look at this. Quantitative data. This is an, another example from our previous school. Uh, 
what was I going to ask? Is this collation or analysis? Hit the chat, show me what you think. I've had three, four responses. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. <laughs> What's your answer though, Michelle? I think I did the oh yes, Michael's gonna present the, the answers as a bar graph. Fantastic, yeah. So this is a merely collated results here, isn't it? Ah, good question coming from Cherie. Should this be in an appendix or included in the body, but with analysis? Cool, we're gonna talk about that in a couple of minutes, Cherie. Um, I, yeah, I have a personal feeling about it, but it, yeah. Well, park that one if we may and come back to that in a couple of minutes. Fantastic. Moving right along. So this is actually the analysis that the same person did of that previous slide. It's data. Okay. And they didn't share it all with us because they must have done it and been able to tell what each year was responding because they've managed to analyze the results into year groups here. So fantastic. And this is just modeling to you um, what an analysis might look like. So analysis of the question, how often is science taught and by who? They have discussed what the results of their information finding, their survey found and specified about variation and what each year group, what its strengths and weaknesses are. Hmm. Let's have a look. I just wanted to show you an example because I've, oh yeah, whoops, I've told you the answer to that. Is this one collation or analysis? And we've already talked about that. This is, this one is the analysis example. Is this analysis of the previous slide? And is more, got, yes. and, and yeah. more than, no, that's right, that's, yeah, yeah. So in that collation slide behind, back one, there wasn't all of that data presented. Which, Cherie, does make me start to wonder what they put in the, um, was there an appendix? But we'll come back to that, come into that. I just thought I'd share with you an example of the beginnings of approach. This isn't the whole thing, but of someone, a previous person's attempt to connect with the community and consult with them. So if we think about quantitative or qualitative, what sort of results are we going to get out of these three questions? Make some comments in the chat line. I'll just give you a minute to have a look at it and, and make some comments for me. Thank you, Michelle. Helen Duff, do you want to be Helen 1 or Helen 2? Who else is still awake? Anyone? <laughs> Michelle's onto it. I agree that the first two 
questions there are quantitative and the last one is more qualitative. So I just wanted to show you an example, partly modeling the community work, consultation work, but also modeling where you could be using both quantitative and qualitative. Yes, I notice that parents don't have a space to say no science talk at all. Yeah, yeah. So we've got a lot to learn from all of these all the time, whether or not you'd want to include that, whether or not you, yeah. Perhaps it, it should have had a space for it. And we never talk about science at all. Hmm. Right. Looking ahead to my next slide here. Ah, it's about making meaning. So this person had done some videos of the kids actually doing an experiment and she was observing as well but she just videoed it as a backup in case she needed to go back and check out what she'd written, uh, you know, what she'd noticed. So she did an activity and I think this is the one. Yep. Yes, indeed. Um, across a random selection of children from a range of different year groups groups throughout the school and I'm just showing you two of her summaries here and so she set herself up with a strength weakness interesting sort of chart so that she could make some notes on about what was going on there I guess I just wanted to show you that so that you can see another way of making some meaning out of some of your information gathering And so this is more of a qualitative approach because she's using making some subjective decisions about what she's seeing. Um, and you, yeah. But she's finding out some interesting and useful things. Uh, where do we go next? Right. So I wanted to show you. This is another example from another school again who asked the question, how can the science leadership team support you in your future science teaching and learning? And this is sort of qualitative in that it was totally unprescribed and that they were just asked to write some, you know, whatever was top of their mind about how the science leadership team could support them in their future learning. So you get this data, this page of responses, what do you do with it? How do you start to analyze that? And so I just wanted to, some, maybe you all know, but I wanted to show in case you're not sure, rather than just uh, picking out your favorite quote from here and going with that, how can we turn this into a slightly more robust piece of research where we can get some themes out from it and, and talk about those themes in our analysis and then therefore in our conclusion and our where to from here. So I tried to do this video this afternoon of myself actually doing this so that I could embed a little video, but that didn't work. It was very awkward and then I ran out of time. So to um, try again once I had more staff at home. <laughs> Busy waiting all day for someone to get home to video me. But this is my approach and I'll just talk you through what I do. When I get a list of responses like this, I start at the top and read the first one, continue staff PD and planning. So I set myself up a chart. This is all about support. At the top there were 17 responses people responding. The first one mentioned that they want more PD and they mentioned that the staff planning. So I start to set myself up a chart. Of course I don't know yet how many columns across I'm going to need. That just evolves as I do it. 
So I start over there on the left and I set myself up, I write PD and I give myself one tally mark because one person so far, that very top person has said continue staff PD and planning. So I also give myself a tally mark in staff planning. Then I read the next one, PD. So I give myself another tally mark in PD. Next one, showing examples. Okay, so someone in my team, someone, one of the staff want more examples. So I write, give myself another column here, show EGs, and I give it a tally mark. Next person, PD around following the competencies and nature of science, that is training teachers to use teachers up to use these in their practice, model it to the students and see the students apply it also. Teachers need to be shown how to design, plan and resource engaging science activities. My goodness, this person, is, there's a lot there, isn't there? I know, oh, whoops, too far back. So, so what I've done here is I've given them a tally mark in PD, that's that third mark around along, and I've actually put a little circle around that because I know I want to know to come back to their comment again. It could be worth my while coming back and exploring that comment further. Uh, back to the list, where are we up to? Staff meeting PD before each science unit, opportunities for teachers to observe lessons and sharing of resources. So this is where that observe lessons columns crops up with one tally mark and sharing resources gets its first tally mark. So you, you can see how it's an evolving method and I just make my way across the page adding new columns as I come to new comments that tell me something different and by giving them each a tally I won't torture you by going through the whole list of them here but if we had gone through the whole list of them, this is what we would end up with. So we'd end up with a whole heap of squiggles on a piece of paper, 10 of them related to a desire for more PD, two to staff planning, et cetera, et cetera. So you can total them. And then I start to think about what ones um, might relate to each other. Um, are they kind of related? So staff planning, the people who talked about staff planning were also interested in sharing resources. So is there, is there some commonality there so that I can further identify a need that I might be able to, to um, provide for in the future? Uh, the integrating, the people who wanted help with how to integrate science, I thought that that dot, 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 relates, relates also to perhaps PD, as does the people who thought that they were um, weak in their own knowledge of science. That could be something that I address through PD. Uh, and also the examples, or well, showing examples of how to do things, that could definitely also crop up. And PD. So you can see now that PD potentially has gone from having 10 people that were interested in, you know, wanting PD. We could add even a few more there um, because of the specific way. Oh, we've got some comments coming through. Oh, yay. Thank you, Michelle. Oh, yay. Thank you, Helen, one or two. I'm still not sure. Fantastic. Yay. So, yeah, this is the Bridget approach to doing this sort of thing. And it works really well for all sorts of this qualitative data, whether it's interviews, whether it's lists like that this person got from here. So I thought it might be useful. I don't know. Is it useful? Do you want to spend two minutes yourself with a scrap of paper in front of you looking at this sample here? This is a different question. Grow. What could we improve in science teaching and learning at our school? Do you want to just have a go at what would be your first three headings as you make, your, make yourself a chart for that? 
we don't need to do it all the way to the end. Okay, Cherie's asked a good question. If you're going to graph this, do you have to state that it came from coding a qualitative question? Um, I personally think you should. Yes, I think you should because, yeah. Thank you, Michael. Well, exactly. Let's see, on my, this sheet here, remember where I drew that circle around the third PD stroke? My third tally stroke. I, I said, oh, I'm going to put a circle around that in case I want to come back to it later. This, the PD quote that it relates to was this incredible sentence here that sums up the sort of support that this person wanted. They wanted PD around following the competencies and nature of science. That is training teachers up to use these in their practice, to model it to the students and see the students apply it also. Teachers need to be shown. That is the sort of quote that would be worth using and presenting in your, in your analysis. It is probably the gem of that entire page. Yeah? How does that work for you, Cherie? All good? Sorry, I'm busy leaning over towards Michael to read his screen. Cool. I know you can all read Jen's comments too, so she's giving us the big thumbs up for that sort of approach and for saying that it came from qualitative comments if you're going to pre present it as a graph um, because it just yeah increases the robustness of your whole system. Brilliant. Could we have the surveys as a appendix? I'm not entirely sure what you mean by that. Oh yes. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. So you've got the questions and you're yeah. So that's something that I parked earlier from was it I think Cherie asked, should you be putting that collated responses into your report? And I sort of I parked it because I was going to get to report writing in a couple of minutes, Radka. Um, but yeah, I'm just gonna spill the beans now and say <laughs> My personal approach, and it's not the only approach by any means, because it's, it's, you're not wrong to include your results in your report as part of the body of your report. However, I, when I read a report, I want it to be really succinct and I want it to tell me what I really need to know and not bog me down with extra stuff as a, as a consumer of that report. Um, if I want more depth, then I want to know that I can find that, more, that depth further on. So I would consider personally, just personally speaking, that your results, the collated data should be, I would always put them myself in an appendix but I would put my analysis of them in the body of a report. What have we got going on over there? Oh, private conversation. Oh, <laughs> private, okay, I won't. Okay. Um, yep, so I thought, yep, yeah, how did, did you have a go at modeling that? I'm sure you know what to do. You've seen me do it once. You guys would be terrific, I guess. Making So if we looked at this and we were setting up another chart, making sure there are enough resources for practical activities. My first column would read resources and I'd put a tally mark. My next one would be PD. My next one would be modeling. And if we were to continue that on down throughout all of the responses, 
we would end up with quite a lot. I've actually done this, I think, with this person. And there were, again, a lot of PDs came up. Uh, and then we could talk about how much we could quantify that. And also a lot of resources. Yeah. So there we go. Moving on. Whoops. Just flicked my mouse across. Uh, this is another method that somebody used when they were analyzing a video of some students who'd done an experiment. Uh, this was just a, a system that they set up for themselves to help go through that video footage and make some sense of it. So again, we're talking qualitative data that they're trying to make meaning out of in order to analyze it. Exactly what they meant by not engaged, somewhat engaged, neutral, somewhat eager, very eager, uh, I'm not sure. So it's far from perfect, but I'm just sharing with you this sort of approach. Uh, so then they went on to rank the different participants in a variety of areas. Okay, so that's a sort of thing that you could use also. I know it's a five point scale. There we go. First thing wrong, it's got an <laughs> an even number. Not ideal. An, oh, sorry, an odd number, not ideal. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. So do we have any people, do people feel confident about how to analyze and make meaning from the information that, that you gather. How are we going there? Uh, yep, all good. Goodly, goodly, good. Cool. So really the last part of the presentation tonight is about report writing. And and I haven't consulted any of the official documentation, actually, Jen. This is just me going off my version of logic. But I think the first thing that you'd need is an overview statement about the school and its situation. Um, I need to, you'd need to say the name of the school, where it is in the country, you know, to say Westburn School is of no use to the person reading it if they don't intimately know where Westburn School is. So name of the school, the location, the decile rating perhaps. What is really, really useful is the role and the staff because that lets the reader just get their head around how big a school are we talking here? How many staff have they got? How big a community have they got? around them, that sort of carry on. Oh yeah, yeah, Michael's saying gender. Is it a single sex school or is it a co-ed school? More really useful overview information. Just so that, like I say, the reader can get their head around it. Um, as Jen has said a couple of times, I believe, you know, although no one from MB has yet ever asked to read, I don't think, any of these reports themselves. And she and Janine summarise them for all of the milestone reporting. It is possible because the, the reports that you submit are, are reporting on a, on a government funded program and it is possible that someone else would want to read them. So that's why it's really important to give an overview of your situation so that the reader, assume the reader knows nothing, basically, and you need to set the scene. Please share what is your overarching evaluative question. Um, I've actually proofread a few of these where it's not been clear at all. And, and the whole report has been written and hasn't actually shared what that evaluative question was. What is the purpose for all of this information gathering, for all of this thinking and making meaning? What were you aiming for? What are you aiming for? 
methodology. So how, do, how have you gone about seeking this information? What combination of surveys, interviews, observations, videoing activities, et cetera, et cetera, have you done? Um, and are we going to read about in this report? The results. Oh, oh, I did. Right, and the methodology, the numbers of people involved. Okay. So if you could add that in, I'll add it in on my notes so that I can fix it. Number of people involved. The next part down, I've made a mistake and I've just copied and pasted the last one. And I'm sure I wrote something for results there. Anyway, what would I say? Ignore what's written there and pretend that that orange bar has something else written inside it. Let me see. It would be something like a collation of the data that was gathered. So and the results Oh, Michael's so the results section isn't just your raw data, it's a collation of the data. So it's maybe um, charts or whatever of the actual um, data that you've brought together, that you've collated, and then that's the raw material for your analysis. Yeah, yeah. and then this is where I'm saying, yeah, that makes sense. This is where I was saying that it would be my preference, actually, to take the results out of there and pop it down in the appendix. That, that would be my approach. Um, because the next bit that I would like to talk about after my methodology really is the analysis of the results. So this is a, like a, a written overview of your numeric groupings of your results um, where you're looking for trends from, from each each individual question or each section, okay? It's talking about what you now know. It'll be talking about some strengths, some things that are going well. It'll be talking about some things, some gaps where some things need to be, could be attended to. And it could even be talking about some of those interesting things that we talked about before, Michael, things that crop up that you weren't expecting. And it's a, it's a discussion of what that means that's your analysis. Yeah. Uh, your conclusion section is how does it relate? How does all of this analysis relate to your big evaluative question? Okay. It should make some connections there and it should also inform what your next steps are um, as regards achieving your big evaluative question doing better in that area. Uh, it, it should have some goals in it going forward. What are the target areas that we need to focus on knowing this? Now that we have this evidence that we've analysed that tells us where our strengths are and where our gaps are, it's very clear that if we want to be more effective from our big evaluative question, then our next steps need to be this, this, and this. And we need to be, as a science leadership team, delivering PD, um, focused PD around whatever it might be. Say it was a weakness in critiquing evidence, for example. And, and so you should be spelling out there some of your SMART goals and, and directions that you're going to journey on for the next few months, six months, be year before your next impact report. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Yeah, because that becomes the direction. There's no point in doing PD um, on things that people are already good at or strong with. So this is that's the whole point of this. And then your appendix will have your raw data, your collated graphs, charts, uh, links to any other relevant material and any references if that's appropriate. But remember it's an official report so uh, things, like, things like photographs of children having a very happy time doing science 
aren't really relevant to this report. This is, this is just uh, presenting what you've done in your, in your review process. How does it go? Oh yeah, go Michael. Is your, I'll stick my microphone on. Um, my, my thought is that in the appendix, it's also really good to include your um, research instruments like the questionnaires that you use and okay. so on, because we've seen from some of the examples that mm -hmm. some of the questions are a bit um, odd and they don't necessarily, the answers that are presented don't necessarily relate very well to the questions. So putting the research instrument so that people can check and say, yes, well, that's a valid question. It, it actually asks, it actually yeah, yeah. follows up what you're trying to evaluate. And I guess I don't agree with um, Bridget, actually. I think that a, a judicious number of photographs of kids doing stuff is part of the data and could go into the um, results or the analysis, just as an example to show that, hey, yes, we are getting success. And I think a picture speaks a thousand words. So I disagree there. Oh, well, well. This is so wonderful in life, eh? It's good. It's all right to disagree. Yeah. Uh, so really, that's the end of my little presentation as regards my whirlwind trip through writing effective instruments, making inf effective instruments for gathering information, gathering information, analyzing it, and writing a report. Have we got some questions? Oh. Yeah. Right. So if people read what um, Jen's written there. Jen, do you want to unmute and talk about your nice comments? Can you hear me? Oh, yes, I can. Hi, Jen. Um, that was marvellous. Um, I just, yeah, it was great tips. I think the thing that um, might be of interest to people listening is that we initially, when we set up this process with STLP, we were hesitant to be this directive in terms yeah. of um, analysis and report writing and collation because we made the assumption that your senior management know how to do this. Uh -huh. and that you would work with your senior management team to actually go through this process because in fact that's what they, they do, or hopefully do, on a regular basis. Uh -huh. This has really been developed in response to the fact that we, re we recognise that for some of you, um, that has been hard to get that guidance, and in fact, it's quite useful for um, for us to um, provide you with that guidance. Can I can I probably also say that a really good thing to do would be before you hand in your um, submit your either your analysis of the science self review and development plan or your impact report. You absolutely insist that your senior management team engages with it in some way, whether it be they just read it but certainly comment, but also maybe you buy from us some extra pair of eyes to read it prior to submission. And no, Bridget hasn't got 85 hours to do that like in the next few weeks. But that is, the, that is how we can do that, you know. Um, so, yeah, um, all the comments are coming up now. That's nothing. We, we can't manage that. We can't manage a school um, or a senior management team that appear totally uninterested. You, as a science leader, which we've invested, you've got to work your best way around it. And I know Helen 1 and 2, whoever, which Helen is speaking, um, you will actually have to, maybe that's a private conversation for us to strategize about actually how you're going to do that because we can't actually make people do anything. Um, but I think this is a really useful thing, Bridget. This has been fabulous. And thank you, Michael, too, because it actually is common sense. Mm. I think, um, yeah, I omitted to say, but I had planned to say absolutely that the value of getting someone else's input or eyes over all of your work, even actually before you send out, for those that haven't started or started gathering any information, 
before you send out any of your surveys, um, ask someone in your in your leadership team or a friend at school who ha has a good or, or another STLP or ask for some hours to get someone else some friendly eyes over it, be they mine or be they someone else's. Because to make a mistake or to not ask things as well as you could and not get the right information right at the get-go really limits everything that you can do or show at least from then on. Um, yeah, so. Actually, it's good practice when you're doing um, re research and making surveys and questionnaires to find some volunteers to practice answer it and see whether they can actually read it and make sense of it. And that can be a salutary experience. Yeah, good point, Michael. Yeah, so how are we going, team? It appears that Sharon is desperate, so she needs an answer. Lisa's signalling okay. us. Sharon, what's your question? Sorry, Michael's just going to make his screen question things. Sharon, do you just want to talk? Unmute your microphone, Chuck. She would like. Oh. Oh, hi, I just wanted to know, okay, I'm sharing my data with the staff and the community and everything, but have you got an innovative way to share the information that I've got with the kids? Like something that you're going to find interesting. That's what I wanted to know. Hmm. Not something that I've thought lots about. Um, I think you guys are the real experts at sharing information innovatively with your children. You so this is like, sorry, what was that? You spot them out of ideas. So I was oh, to out of ideas. Brain. <laughs> are we talking like sharing the results of the engagement survey or what sort of results are we talking about sharing? Well, the, like I interviewed um, focus groups of students Oh, great. And my kids knew, the whole school knew that I was coming back to look at where we were at with science and where we needed to get to. And I just kind of feel like there needs to be a follow-up with them. Like, it doesn't have to be in-depth or anything, but I just feel like there needs to be a follow-up with them. But I'd like to make it something that was interesting. Anyone else is welcome to chip in here. I think if you used focus groups, then maybe you could get them together for a focus group celebration of some sort. Um, and then you could share with them the themes and, and what you got out of their research, uh, out of their responses, just briefly. It doesn't need to be in great depth because, and then you can say things like that because of their contributions, that has affected the direction that the school is going to take in their science and so they can expect to perhaps be seeing some more of this or this or this and, I'm and what's coming up for them. I'm Jen. wondering whether an interesting thing to do too with your kids um, at year seven and eight, um, maybe it's an opportunity for once you've talked to them about what you've noticed in terms of trends and patterns, however you do that, it could be an opportunity for them to report to other kids in the school like at a, sh a small team assembly or something. So what they're looking like is like kids who've actually interacted with information and they're actually in they're interested as a group in what's going to happen as a result of this in terms of their education. Because I think at Year 7 and 8, they'd really quite like that. That's Thank you. That's an amazing mind. idea. Jen, you speak my mind. I was about to mention that. The other thing that I thought in the celebration of the actual achievement, maybe to make up a, a, um, a cake in the form of a pie chart to, uh, showing some of the oh. results. <laughs> Go, Michael. Fantastic. How's everyone else going? Anyone got anything else that we need to talk about? Yep, that's right, Isabel. It could be a mini math focus, looking at the data in terms of a pie chart, especially if it's like a Michael's edible pie chart cake. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, 
definitely. Um, brilliant. Anything else? I think we're there, aren't we? I think, I think I'm there. I'm there. Have we got any more questions or comments or thoughts? Because I'd like to thank Bridget um, if we haven't. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody, for being here online. Um, tell people who have missed this that hopefully the recording will be um, online in the next couple of days. So, um, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks, Bridget. And good night to everybody. Cheers. Thank you, Thank you all. Ka kite.